I'm going to invite your attention to the word of the Lord in the book of Titus and chapter number two. Titus and chapter two. I'm going to begin reading from verse 11 through 14. And I do want to remind you of our service tonight. We have a 6.30 service, and those of you who are our guests, if you have the time, service begins at 6.30, and we would be excited if you are able to come back. Titus in chapter 2 and verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation had appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. And my subject is the foundation of godly living the foundation of godly living. Let us ask God to touch us and to give us ears that we can hear and a heart that we can understand and embrace the word of the Lord. Father, one more time, Lord, we come to you. We thank you for all of your loving kindness, Lord, and we're thankful for all that you have done. Thank you for your power and the great God that superintends the universe, but also look over us. And we thank you that we serve the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob, the God that Moses dealt with and the God that Peter and Paul dealt with. And we thank you that we're part of that great family that you began years ago and that you have brought us out of darkness into this marvelous light. We are so very privileged and we are so grateful, Lord. And, oh God, we pray that you would keep your hand upon us. Lamb of God, that you would help us, Lord, and you would chart a course for us. And you would craft a life, O oh God, that it would represent you. I pray that you would help us today, Lord, as we are in your presence with the angels attending. And we are thankful for your word. The word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. O oh God, keep your hand upon us, Lord. Lord, we command the blessings of God to be upon your people. And that, O oh God, we may serve you for the whole length of our lives. God in holiness, and that Lord Jesus at the end of life's journey will hear well done. We take authority over this atmosphere, O oh Lord, and we bind everything that is unlike you. We cast it down. And Lord, we are forbidding it to operate in this whole area. And then we are releasing the spirit of praise and revelation and faith and conviction, Lord, to be had so that you get the glory and the honor and we'll get the joy that come from salvation. Touch the lips of Claire, I pray. When we shall have left this place, when we exit the doors, we will know that we have stood in your presence. Hear from heaven. Amen. Perform, Lord, God, these mercies. And then, Lord, we will be careful to praise you and to honor you and to give you all of the glory that is due to your wonderful name. In Jesus' name we pray and all the people say amen. God bless you and you may be seated. The foundation of God living. 
Now, because of the, the teaching on this subject, subject of grace, that there have been many proponent of a grace that is not had and not evident and not put forth in the word of God, then the apostolic sometimes are quite reluctant to talk about grace. But I don't think we should be reticent to talk about grace because grace is really part of the plain teaching of the word of God. And God's grace as put forth in his word is designed to get us out of sin. But not only is it designed to get us out of sin, it's also designed to keep us out of sin. And so grace is not a license to sin, but really rather a reason to live for God. In Romans chapter 6, verse 1, the apostle Paul is talking to us in regards to grace. He had ended his previous chapter by saying, where sin abound, grace did much abound, much more abound. And so he asked this very cogent question, what shall we say then? Grace is like that. If darkness is like that, what, what shall we say then? If, if darkness is there and grace is going to increase to cover that darkness, to apply to that darkness, they said, what shall we, we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Because he had argued that where sin was, then grace was increased to deal with that sin. So he's asking a plain question. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? Should sin be a, a license? Should grace be a license for us to continue in sin? And then if you notice in verse 2, a resounding God forbid. We shouldn't continue living in sin because grace is there. He said, how shall we that are dead to sin? So the saint of God is really dead to sin. And as, as a consequence, we were then planted together in the likeness of Jesus' death. So we're dead to sin. So really, if you look at grace then, once grace appears, we should not sin. That's the whole idea behind grace. So this morning, I'm going to mention four things. I'm going to talk about the appearance of grace. Then secondly, the teaching of grace. Thirdly, the effects of grace. And then lastly, the hope of grace. Grace is very important in Scripture. And as such, then, we need to talk about it from time to time. So firstly, the appearance of grace. Verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation had appeared to all men. So right away, we know that grace is universal. It's appeared unto all men. It's not confined to the Jews. It's not confined to any geography. Not confined to any language group. It has, it's appeared unto all men. Now, when we see God deal or dealt with Israel or was dealing with Israel in the Old Testament, when we study those, those scriptures, it is quite instructive for us because just as God has dealt with Israel in the Old Testament, then God is going to deal with us in the New Testament on the same basis. If we look, for instance, at Exodus chapter 15 and verse 13, this verse is, is probably um, the most important verse in Exodus. 
And this is right after God had taken them across the Red Sea. And so he says here, Thou in thy mercy has led forth the people which thou has redeemed. Thou has guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. Now there, there are many things that's in, in this verse of which I'm not going to really delve into. But suffice to say this. We see that Israel was enslaved in Egypt. And they were under a tyrant that is called Pharaoh. Israel had no way of getting out of Egypt. They were subjugated. The Bible said they were made to serve with rigor. There was no mercy that was extended to them, but they were under constant stress. But the Bible said God in his mercy, God in his mercy showed up specifically through the hand of Moses. And he redeems Israel out of Egypt by the Passover lamb. And then he led them out with a strong hand. And his purpose was to lead them to a place of his holy habitation. And so God took them out. And he had a place for them to go. Where, Whenever God take us out from some place, he always intend to bring us to some place else. He never will just take us out and leave us. He's always, he's always very purposeful. So it took them out, and then he led them to the holy place of his habitation. By the same way, by the same token, we really are enslaved to sin of which Egypt is a type under a rulership of Satan of which Pharaoh is a type. And we have no way of getting out from under the rule of Satan. There is no way that we can extricate ourselves. There is no way that we can leave sin because sin is like a tyrant. Once it get a hold of you, there's no letting go of you. And so, we who are delivered, we can, we can tell the story. But people who are still in bondage, they may not admit it. But they are in bondage and Satan is a tyrant. And Satan won't let them go very far. Sometimes he will let them come to church, but not too often now. And when he let them come to church, he's going to tell them, well, don't listen to that message too much now. He will provide some distraction for them. He will do all kind of things because he is really not fixing to let you go. He want to keep you bound. He want to keep you in his employ. But I rise to tell you that God has a, a mechanism just as Moses was sent to let the people out of Egypt, then God has a mechanism to get you out of where you have been enslaved. If you notice Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 12, Paul is telling those Ephesian people, said that at that time, that is before you got saved, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenant of promise, and notice now, having no hope. When you are in the em employ of the devil, there is no hope in there. 
He is a tyrant. And he will work you to death. And he won't think anything about it. He will cause some people to be strung out on drugs. And the devil doesn't really care. He'll cause some people to kill one another. And he's just laughing. He will let people do all kind of real, some of the very most egregious sin. And the devil is having a good time about it. So we have no hope. In those kind of condition. But I want to tell you that grace, this is where grace shows up. This is where the grace of God shows up and offers to us deliverance. It is there. But I want you to notice that Israel back there in Egypt had to act in order for God to bring them out. How did they have to act? Well, they had to kill the lamb. Then they had to, they, they had to get the blood and they had to paint their door frames. Then they had to pack up their stuff and get out. When the grace of God appears to us, we also have to do something. We can't just sit around and just say the grace of God is going to do everything for us. It will not. Grace is really God's favor on undeserving sinners. God's favor shows up while we were yet sinners. And we can talk. But really, the reason why we're saying of God today was not because we were that righteous. It's not because we were that good. It's not because we had done great works. But the Lord showed up. I mean, we boast now. We run around and strut our stuff, but it wasn't supposed, it didn't because we were so good. Some of us people had to witness to us many times before we got saved. People had to teach us Bible study. People had to urge us. People had to almost force us to come to church. And songwriter said, I went to a meeting one night. My heart wasn't right, but something got a hold of me. So it was the grace of God, hallelujah, that got a hold of us in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Here's what Paul says. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, not saved, don't have the Holy Ghost, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That is what the grace of God will do for us. We could not save ourselves, but God's grace brought us salvation. When God incarnate himself in man, in the man Christ Jesus, when he came down to the earth, when he came down here, he came here to redeem us from the bondage of sin. So when God came out of heaven, it was because you and I were in sin. We had a predisposition towards sin. A matter of fact, until God get us out of Egypt, we always will sin. I've met people that say, well, you know, they're good folk. They don't kill anybody, don't rob anybody. And that's all well and good. They distribute food to the poor. They, they're charitable and so forth, but that's not getting you into heaven. That's not going to get you into heaven, no way. But the man Christ Jesus came here to pay the price for redemption for us. Man's religion will never help him. During the study in Bible college, we had one subject called man's religion. And there's a whole plethora of religious teachings and People that have come and said they're this and that and all of that. But man's religion is not going to help you because man's religion originated in his head. And anything that originated in man's head has some flaws in it. You ever notice that even our science book every year they have to update it? But God's book never needs any update because it's complete. So we can't trust any of man's religion. We have to look at what God has provided. 
Jesus Christ, when he came down, he became our substitute. He died in our place because we were criminals. We won't admit it, but outside of Christ Jesus, we are criminals. We are rebels. We are sinners. But the man Christ Jesus died as a substitute for us. If you notice in 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 2 rather, and verse 24, the apostle says, Who his own self bear our sin in his own body? On the tree that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you're healed. So the Lord took in his own body our sins. All sin then is judged at Calvary, whether it's progressively or retroactively. All sins are judged at Calvary. So Jesus Christ died to redeem us, and so he could provide grace. You see, God cannot arbitrarily forgive sin. God couldn't just say, I forgive you. There has to be a basis. There has to be a logical reason. When Jesus died at Calvary, when he paid that price, it allows God to forgive sin. The man Christ Jesus paid that ransom price. He paid the price so that he could redeem it. God can't just say, I forgive you. No, there has to be a basis. There has to be some platform for God to do that. The word redeem actually means to set free by paying a price. So when the Lord paid the price, he redeemed us. And you say, what was the price? Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. Has to pay a price. Can't just do that. He has to pay a price. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from your vain conversation. Conversation means lifestyle received by tradition from your fathers. But with the precious blood of Christ. As a lamb without blemish and without spot. So the redemptive price was Jesus' death. So Jesus then was a ransom for our sins. His death met the demands of a righteous God. The Bible says the soul that sinned, it shall surely die. We were sinners, so that means we were to die. Jesus took our place so that we don't have to die because he paid the price. So we then can be made free. That is the grace of God. So Jesus' blood means we can receive forgiveness of our sin if we ask for it. See, if we don't ask for it, we won't receive it. If we don't ask for it, sometimes we may feel like we don't have sin, so we won't ask for it. But the Bible says all have sinned. So even you feel good about yourself that you've never sinned, the Bible contradicts you. And the Bible says, let God be true. So that means all of us have sinned. So we have to acknowledge that we're sinners. And then when we come to God, we say, Lord, we need your forgiveness. We have to acknowledge we're, we're sinners. Condemned to a devil's hell. And when we come to Jesus, we're going to ask him, Lord, please forgive us of our sins. How does God do that? Well, look, let's look at Acts chapter 11 and verse 18. Very instructive. When they heard these things, the setting, of course, is a follow-up to the encounter with Cornelius and the Gentiles. And when Peter had gone to Cornelius' house, and preach to him about Christ and Jesus' death and his burial and his resurrection. And the fact that he had sent the Holy Ghost upon them and had given them hope of eternal life. So the Bible says while Peter was speaking to Cornelius, the Holy Ghost fell on them that heard the word. And they were so surprised that the Gentile received the Holy Ghost because... It really wasn't meant for the Gentile in a sense because salvation is really of the Jews, but God chose to fill the Gentile with the Holy Ghost. So when the, when the elders that 
Jerusalem heard now, they took Peter to task. Say, why did you go to Gentiles? Did you not know that this thing is really Jewish? So Peter began to tell those elders in Jerusalem. Say, now I went and God told me that I should go. And while I was preaching, God filled them with the Holy Ghost. So our text says, when they heard these things, they held their peace. So that means the elders just shut their mouths because they couldn't do anything. God filled them with the Holy Ghost. And so what did they do? They glorified God, saying that. Now notice this is very important. Then had God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. So repentance is a gift that God gives us, allows us to repent, because we can never, we can never take take advantage of God's grace until we repent. The only way that God is going to deal with us is on the basis of repentance. And repentance is a gift that God gives you. He allows your mind to repent. When you have a desire to seek and to serve God, God will open your mind and let you know that you're a sinner and you need to repent. Many people don't repent because they don't feel they have a need. When God show you you have a need, that's a gift from God. There are many people who come to this church and hear a word, but God never allowed them to repent. Why? Because they don't feel that they need to repent. And so they come in, they hear the word, they feel that they're okay, and they go out just like they came in. That's never the will of God. If someone comes here and is not saved, Bible saved, it is always the will of God for you to be Bible saved before you get out of here. Always. No exception. But the point is, you have to ask for forgiveness. Because the moment you think that you're okay... The moment you feel that you are all right, the instant you feel like you've been doing good work so you're okay, you haven't stolen from anybody, you haven't killed anybody, so you're going to have the moment that is your mindset, that means you're going to stay just like that. You're not getting ready to repent. You're not getting ready to get, get baptized. No, sir, you feel you're okay. But when that happens, it means you're going to be in trouble. So grace then is, is, is really given to us when God allows us to repent. When we repent, then we can fully access all of the benefits of God's grace. And when that happened, my friend, God can then change your standing. See, every sinner stands under God's condemnation. It doesn't matter if you feel like you're righteous. Every sinner stands under condemnation. The reason why the Lord came here, because all of us was under condemnation and bound to a devil's hell. And so when, we, when God grants us the blessing to repent, and you will see, is not everybody that come here will repent. God is able to justify us. Justification allow God to change our standing. Changes our standing. When grace shows up, God gives us the ability to repent. When we repent, God changes us our standing. From one of condemnation to one of favor. When we repent, we become a friend of God. When we repent, we can draw near to God. When we repent, we can be on the same page with God. If we don't repent, it doesn't matter how much good we do. Lord have mercy, I feel the Holy Ghost. I said, until we repent, it did not matter how much good you did. It will not amount to a hill of beans or a raw pin. So grace shows up. Secondly, the teaching of grace. Verse 12. 
teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Here then, grace is personified, i.e. is given human characteristics. Grace then is going to teach us. So not only, not only is grace showing up, but once grace comes, it is going to be your teacher. See, a lot of people don't understand that grace is a teacher. Grace is going to teach us about the one that gave the grace. Grace here then is seen as a teacher. Grace not only changes our position, but it changes four things. It changes our attitude. It changes our appetite. It changes our ambition. And it changes our actions. Grace is going to teach us. When grace comes, it is not going to allow you to stay where you were. It's going to teach you it is time to get out of where you've been. Teaching has the idea of disciplining. We're disciplined by God's grace and trained to glorify God. This is really the entire training process. There's teaching, there's encouragement to live by those teachings, there's correction, and then ultimately there's discipline. Godly living has both then a negative aspect and a positive aspect, as in our text. Firstly, from the negative side, he says that it's going to teach us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust. So from the negative side, Grace is going to teach us that we must de deny everything that is ungodliness. Everything that is unlike God, grace is going to tell us, don't partake of it. So the grace of God is not just going to save us so that we can serve the devil. The grace of God, once it changes our position, is going to say the only person you can serve is Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. This is how grace is so wonderful. When you get the grace of God, it won't allow you to live in sin. You can come in this church and get saved while being shacked up. But once you get saved, you can't remain shacked up. Hello, Oh, Holy Ghost. See, that's, that's the beautiful thing about grace. It's going to teach you that denying ungodliness, you have to, everything that is ungodly, the grace of God is rejected. Don't do it. The grace of God will not allow you to gamble. Lord have mercy. Denying everything that is ungodly. When the grace of God comes, he's going to put his finger on that going to teach you the grace of God is a teacher. If you used to drink, become drunk, grace of God said, hey, you got to stop that. You can't go back to that dog track anymore. Hey, you got jealousy. Hey, that's envy. Hey, that's all sin. You got, the grace of God is a teacher. So don't you ever talk about the grace of God if you don't want to be taught. Teaches that everything that is ungodly, everything that you can invite God to come and partake of. Any place that you were wanting to go, that you know you can't take God there, the grace of God put the finger on it. Hey, you got to quit there. You can't invite dog, God to go to the dog track with you. He's not coming there. So if you can't invite God to go with you to the dog track, it means you're not supposed to go there. See, great, this, this is very simple. You don't have to have a degree to figure this thing out, folks. The grace of God then is a teacher. 
And then it teaches you that you can't, you must avo avoid worldly lusts. See, the grace of God is not just a license for you to just sin. Grace of God, most, a lot of people probably better off don't even get the grace of God. Because the grace of God is going to hound you. That you've got to deny worldly lusts. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15 to 17, here's what John says. Love not the world. So once you are partaker of God's grace, you can't love the world. Lord, have mercy. See, th this, is, this is why most people don't teach the real grace of God. They just teach a cheap grace. But the real grace of God is going to tell you love not the world. Love not the world. The world is a system. It is a spirit. It is a mindset. And the grace of God, once you get it, is going to tell you to love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the Bible said the love of the Father is not in him. Now observe, there's three things in the world. For all that is in the world. All of the pleasures in Hollywood. All of those hard body clubs. All of those strip joints. All of those theaters with their worldly stuff. All that is in the world. See, when you come to an apostolic church, you may feel uncomfortable here because when we get ready to talk about the grace of God, we're rolling out a teacher. All that is in the world, observe. The lust of the flesh. The lust of the eyes. And the pride of life. Those are the only three things that's there. That's the only thing that's there. And that's where most people get caught up. The love, the glitz, and the lights, and all the moving and, and shaking, all of that stuff. And the flesh loves that. Loves to indulge. Love to drink. Love to carouse. Love to do all of that stuff. When the grace of God comes, put his finger on it. Friend, you can't do that. So you don't want the grace of God if you don't want to quit drinking. Lord, have mercy. You don't want to, you don't want to know about the grace of God if you, don't want to, if you don't want to quit hating. And quit trying to get even and take revenge and talk bad about people. And be jealous over what people have. And envy what people, you don't, if you don't want to quit those things, then you don't want to talk about the grace of God. Because the grace of God is going to hound you. The grace of God is going to remind you that you spoke evil of your brother. That you said something against your sister. The grace of God is going to hound you. Say anything that's worldly lust. You like going to those theater. Like going to doing all kind of crazy stuff. The grace of God is going to convict your heart. And say you know you can't do that anymore. Places I used to go I go there no more. Grace of God is going to tell you to delete a lot of those ungodly phone numbers you have. Hallelujah. All of those loser friends you have, grace of God going to say, delete, delete, delete. Delete, delete. How about this one? Lord? Delete. How about this? Delete. You won't have enough time to get it out. He just said delete. Some of those old friends say, you going back to church again? I mean, you just come from church. Delete. See, all of those folk, all of those folk mean you know well, no good. And the grace of God going to tell you to delete them. 
David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let's go into the house of the Lord. That's where you need to be. David said, I'll dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. So any friend that will tell you not going to church so often, delete. See, that's the grace of God. That's the real grace of God. And you deny all of that stuff. So when we talk about the grace of God, it's not a license to do wrong things. It's really an opportunity to live for God. I love to go to the house of God. I get to go to the house of God. I get to go pray. I get to study the word of God. I get to become more like Jesus. I'm denying all of the ungodliness and all of the worldly lusts. And you notice what John said. He says all of that will pass away. All of what is in the world. There's going to be a time when all of the things that is in this world is going to come to an end. And the world pass away and the lust thereof. But he that does the will of God. So, friend, the most thing we want to do is what is the will of God? Lord, I want to do your will. I want to die to myself. I want to die to the flesh. I want to die to worldly lust. And I want to do your will. And the will of God is for us to live godly, soberly, and righteously. So, you notice from the positive side then, we should live soberly. That's how we live. We live soberly. That is, we don't drink. We, this, is, this is something that you're living soberly. That means you are disciplined. There's sobriety among you. I mean, we live soberly. We live righteously. We live godly. Righteousness is doing right things. And if you observe quite plainly, he says, in this present world. So that means we're not just looking to live righteously in heaven we must live righteously in tampa right here and we will always remember this god will never tell us to do something or ask us to do something that we can't do so anything that god asks us to do we are well able to do it so if we if we're asked to deny ungodly godliness and worldly lust that means we can do it Thirdly, we will look at the effects of grace. Verse 14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. The purpose then of the incarnation was for God to give himself for us. We've said that. Redeeming us from all iniquity. So then, Bethlehem, when Jesus Christ came, Bethlehem was God with us. Jesus is really God manifest in the flesh. This is why he, he's really called Emmanuel. Emmanuel is God with us. So Bethlehem was God with us. Calvary, when he went to Calvary, was God for us. When he died on Calvary, it was for your sin and my sin. And then Pentecost is God in us. And the day of Pentecost, people received the Holy Ghost, so now it's God in us. And once God comes in us, God is going to give us the ability he is going to give us the predisposition. He is going to give us the mindset to live for him. So God's purpose was not only to redeem us, but also to purify us so that we could come and have fellowship with him. Just like Adam, like he walked with Adam in the cool of the day, God wants to purify us so that we can walk with him in the cool of the day. Now, here is what we need to consider. When God purifies us and we start to walk with him, God really is wanting to walk with us all day. All day, all night, all this week, all next week, 
all this month, all next month, all this year, all next year. As long as we live, God wants to walk with us. That means we don't have any opportunity to go back into the devil's camp. So if you are thinking about just walking for God just a little bit and then run and walk with the devil, God says, uh-uh, uh-uh. You have to serve him all the days of your life. All the days of your life. I had one bishop, he was talking, and he said he was talking to this young man, and, and this young man was so excited about getting saved, getting the Holy Ghost, getting in the church. And so then he told this young man, he said, now, I'm going to tell you something. That in heaven, there is no marrying, neither is there any given into marriage in heaven. And this young man was all about the flesh. And so once he heard there was no marrying or given into marriage in heaven, he told that bishop, he said, man, I, I, need, to, I need to rethink about this thing. I, I, I don't know if I can really go to heaven like that. See, some folk... They just want to walk with God for a little while and then walk with the devil for the rest of the day. They feel like once they get that little prayer in and attend that little church service for, for one week, that's, that's it for the whole week. Well, when you get the grace of God, it's not like that. It's going to be the entire week you have to live for God. It is your entire life. So don't ever talk about the grace of God if you're not fixing to live for God your entire life. So God wants to purify us in order for us to be like him. He does this through the church. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and a holy nation, a peculiar people. That you should show forth the praises of him who had called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. When you get into the church of the living God, that's what God has done. He has now made you a people of his name. This word peculiar, it doesn't mean strange, but rather it means that we're unique. We become a private, a really private possession. His only means it belongs to nobody else. So we're peculiar. That means nobody else can have us. We're married to him the entire time we live. As long as we live, we belong to him. So we belong to Jesus. Not only that, we have a seal. In the old days, people that own various things, they put a seal on it. When we get a hold of God, he puts a seal on us. Look at 2 Timothy 2 and verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. When we get a hold of grace and God gets a hold of our life, he puts a seal on us. That means we belong to him as long as we live. We cannot serve the devil not even an iota, not even a day, not even a second. We simply belong to Jesus. We're redeemed from all iniquity. That is mean we're redeemed from lawlessness because really we were rebels against God. We are purified through sanctification. So God is going to purify us. How is he going to do it? Through sanctification. Sanctification is not only an act, but it's also a process. So God is going to purify us. When we get saved, we still have a lot of stuff in us. And God is going to purify us. It takes an entire lifeline to finish this purification. So you can't go anywhere. Once you start serving God, you can't go anywhere. So sanctification is an act 
That's chiefly accomplished when we receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. And such were some of you in the whole litany of sinners and sins. But such were some of you, but you're washed. What's that? When we are baptized in water in the name of Jesus Christ. But you are sanctified. See, when we become sanctified, that means we're set apart. We are, we are put in a place. Sancti to be sanctified means that we're set apart for God's exclusive use. So, the days when you used to party down and drink, once the grace of God get a hold of you, all of those days are finished. Finished, done with, over, ended. Hallelujah. So if you don't want the grace of God to get a hold of you, if you, if you want to live God ungodly, you don't want to talk about the grace of God. Look quickly at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20 and 21. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20 and 21. So in a great house, it's a metaphor now, in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man, observe, if a man therefore purge himself from these, anything that's under undefiling, defiling, he shall be a vessel unto honor, notice now, sanctified and meet for the master's use. So our vessel, we want it to be purified so that God can use us anywhere, anytime, any place, wherever he chooses. We must not then allow ourselves to be used for the devil's purposes. Sanctification then is something that not only separates us from sin, but causes us to be devoted to God. So it separates us from sin, yeah. But it doesn't separate us from sin to go do some more foolishness. We're then devoted to God. Not only is sanctification then an act, but it's also a process. You say, well, how is it a process? This process, as he says in our text, purified unto himself a peculiar people. God purifies us every day. The process of sanctification is going to last for the entire lifetime. Every day we live, we should become more and more like Jesus. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, observe, we're changed into the same image from glory to glory. What does that mean? It means as we look into God's law, into his mirror, into his glass, every time we look in there, there's something for us to drop off. Anytime we look, we're looking in the face of Jesus and we're saying, Lord, we're so unlike you, but we want to be like you. We are we're doing something that you don't do, but we want to be right. So God changes us. How does he do that? With the word of God. Let's turn to John chapter 15, verse 1. I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman, verse 2. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he takes away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So that is like pruning. Every branch that's not bearing any fruit, he's going to prune it cut it off because it's just wasting space. Now observe. Now you're clean through the word which I spoke unto you. This is why we cannot miss service because we're clean not through some kind of a diet. We're not clean because we do certain things. We are clean when we hear the word of God. And the word of God said, if you lie, you've got to quit lying. We're clean through the word. So you got, you've got to hear the word of the Lord. Because that is what's going to purge us. That is what's going to purify us. That is what's going to make us look like Jesus. So going to church once a week, that, my friend, 
is just outrageous. Did you turn the mic? You turn the mic. Did you turn the microphone off? How can we live for God on one meal? If I ask you, if I give you one meal on Sunday, will that be sufficient to last you the entire week until you come back on Sunday? And most people here are going to say, well, no, I can't live on just one meal like that. Neither can you live on one spiritual meal. Can't. Can't. Impossible. Impossible. And we're clean to the word that we hear. So that means we need to hear that word every day. And so this will continue until Jesus return. Let's look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 and 3. Beloved, now are we the sons of God and daughters, if you will. And it doth not yet appear where we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, speaking about Jesus, we shall be like him. So God's desire is for us to be purified to be like Jesus. And we shall see him as he is. Verse 3. And every man that have this hope, if we hope to see Jesus, notice, every man that has this hope in him purified himself even as he, God, is pure. So we continue to purify ourselves by listening to the word of God. And then lastly, the hope of grace. Verse 13. Looking for, excuse me, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. So you will notice then that the hope that we have, the hope of the believer is not to look for the world to get better. You know, sometimes we're thinking the world is going to get better. Well, the Russians are going to act right. Yeah, the people over in the Middle East, well, they'll act right. We'll pray and God will help them to do right. Well, no. Things are going to get worse, folks. Don't you ever think that, well, everything is going to be so good and so forth. No. Things are going What we're looking at right now is the ending of this world. We're looking at the ending of this age. We're not going to be eating McDonald's all the time. We're not going to be pulling into Burger King all the time. We're not going to be frequenting all of Longhorn all the time. Things are winding down. The hope of the church is for Jesus Christ to come back. The hope of the church is not to get a better job. It's not to get a raise at IBM. That's not the hope. The hope of the church is not to get more degrees. I don't have anything against that, but that's not our hope. Our hope is to see Jesus Christ coming back. That's our hope. Jesus said, I go and prepare a place for you. A hope is not to be down here. We're living in a world that has lost its moorings. We have men marrying men, women marrying men. Women, it's just a little while before men start to marry animals. Bestiality. We had a story, I told you about it. One man married a horse. Married a dog. Some marry sheep. Well, that is going to become more pervasive in just a while. So we're not looking for the world to get any better. We're looking for the Lord to come. Lord have mercy. Jesus said in, in John chapter 14, he said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place, I'm going to come back and receive you unto myself. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. Behold, I show you mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the last trump for the trump of the God shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. 
O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? For the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be unto God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus. We are looking, the hope of the church, looking for the blessed hope is for Jesus to come back. I'm not looking for greater things on the world, in the world here. I'm not looking for a bigger house. I'm not looking for a nicer car. I'm looking for Jesus to come. That's the hope, looking for the blessed hope. I'm closing 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. For the Lord himself, this is the blessed hope. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive, I am hoping that we will be alive, that I'll be alive and remain in the church. We shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. I'm looking for a blessed hope. And the grace of God brings this blessed hope. It gives us hope. Our hope is in heaven. The Bible says, here we have no continuing city, but we're looking for one to come. We're like Abraham. We're just, we're just pilgrim and sojourners here, but we're looking for the blessed hope. We are just strangers in this world, but we're looking for the blessed hope. We're looking for Jesus to come back. You can stand up, done. Re Revelation chapter 22, verse 12. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments. That's where we come in. The grace of God has appealed to us and appeared to us so that we continue to do his commandment. That they may have a right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Verse 15. For without observe, for without a dogs and sorcerers. Friend, if you don't make heaven, look at how the scripture describes us. Dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murders and idolaters and whosoever loveth and make it a lie. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. Verse 17. And the spirit and the bride, that's us, say come. If you are without Christ today, we're saying come. And let him that hear it, come. And let him that is a thirst, come. And whoever, who, whoever will, let him come and take up the waters of life freely. The blessed hope. Is Jesus to come. If you are not ready, if the Lord should come before you go through these doors, will you be ready to meet him? If you're not ready, then this is the place to get ready. If you're not ready, the place is right here. And the bride said, come. I am urging you to come. If you haven't received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, if you haven't been sanctified, if you haven't been justified, then you can come. And you can come and ask the Lord for forgiveness because the grace of God is here. And if the grace of God has appealed to your heart, and if you know that you're a sinner and need to repent and need to change, I'm inviting you to come. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm inviting you to come from where you are. And you come and say, God, I know that I'm a sinner. But I know you were, you were crucified for me and rose from my justification. And if you're here, friend, and the grace of God has appealed to your heart, I urge you not to leave out of this place, but to come and ask God for forgiveness. Come and ask God for pardon. Come and ask him to wash you from your sin. Ask him to take your eyes. Help you to take your eyes off of yourself. 
and turn it to Calvary. Ask him to help you not to see yourself how good you are anymore, but to see how good he is. Ask him to help you to turn your eyes to Jesus and ask him to wash you from sin.